This podcast series contains discussion of historical violence, racism, and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. February 21st, 1890, was Judgment Day for Willie Leapart. It had only been a month since the black teenager had been arrested in Lexington, South Carolina. Now he was being brought to trial for allegedly breaking into one of his small southern town's most prominent homes and sexually assaulting Rosa Cannon, a young white woman working for a well-known family. As Willie was walked across the town square from the county jail to the courthouse, he must have been terrified. But in some ways, he was also in a uniquely lucky position. You see, in 1890, most black men accused of such a crime wouldn't have even made it to court. Thousands of black men in this time period were lynched, killed outside the law by mobs, dispensing a kind of vigilante justice without the niceties of a courtroom. At least Willie got a chance to defend himself, to prove his innocence in a court of law. At least, that's how it was supposed to work. I'm Bristow Marchant a reporter for the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. And this is The Wrong Walk Home, The Lynching of Willie Leapart, a podcast from McClatchy and the state about the improbable turns in the case of historic injustice. In our first episode, we looked at the accusations against Willie Leapart in detail and why it was such a dangerous accusation to make against a young black man at the time. In this episode, we'll look at the trial of Willie Leapart and how it didn't play out the way it should have. The records, you know, from the 20th century, late 19th century, are kept in, in, in the basement of what we call today the old courthouse. This is Michael Burgess, a high school history teacher here in Lexington, South Carolina, and a researcher who has brought Willie Leapart's case to light more than 130 years after a major injustice. He went looking for the official court record of Willie Leapart's 1890 trial in the basement of the old Lexington County Courthouse. And so we went down there and started pulling out books. And, and in some of the books, it had basically the trial transcripts, and it was divided by year. So we found 1887, 1888, 1889, 1891, and 1892. We did not find 1890. And whether that's coincidence... Uh, or somebody thought maybe it would be um, useful to get rid of it. It is the missing is one of the missing pieces to this story. Willie Leapart, who was only about sixteen or seventeen years old, was arrested on the night of January twenty sixth, eighteen ninety, and accused of a horrific crime. He was apprehended while walking through Lexington by a group of white men looking for the man who had supposedly attacked 18-year-old Rosa Cannon in a home invasion moments earlier. Rosa was essentially working as a nanny, caring for the young daughter of the Corley family, when she and her younger brother said they were confronted by an unknown black man who entered the house and attacked Rosa. After her brother ran for help, the attacker fled the scene, and she was later presented with a suspect, Willie Leapart whom she identified on site as her attacker. Here's how Rosa described making the identification of Willie Leapart as her attacker when she made a written statement to investigators. The brute was a stranger to me, though I had seen him before. But every look of his hideous face and the tone of his disgusting voice was all so indelibly stamped on my memory that I described him so accurately that he was at once caught and identified by me and my brother without the possibility of a mistake. And the party who was brought before me for identification by my description and whom I identified is the party whom they tell me is Willie Leapart. Willie was then thrown into the county jail to await trial. But here's where we hit a bit of a mystery. Or, well, a mystery within a mystery, considering the wider mystery of Willie's whole story. Between the time Willie was booked into the Lexington County Jail that January night, and when he went on trial February 21st, the exact accusation against him changed. When he was booked into the jail, documents show the charge against him was assault with intent to commit rape. 
But Willie was tried and ultimately convicted of raping Rosa Cannon. So sudden and violent was the outrageous assault and blood curdling the threats that I was paralyzed by fear and my heart seemed to stop beating and I thought I was dying and fully expected to do so. At one point in her account, Rosa will even describe her attacker tearing her clothes while using what she described as, quote, language I cannot repeat even to my mother. That's a significant change to the kind of accusation Willie was facing. And as we'll see, there may have been reasons why the charge against Willie Leapart needed to be changed. It was a dangerous accusation to make, because this was a time when deadly violence against black people was common, even for transgressions as minor as walking behind a white woman without permission. Violence against black people was the norm under slavery. And by 1890, after new freedoms and changes to Southern society had been implemented after the Civil War, violence was now beginning to make a comeback. By the time we get beyond the end of slavery, as we're moving into the late 19th century, early 20th century, lynching becomes the way of the South. This is Jennifer Dixon McKnight, an assistant history professor an African-American studies professor at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I don't know if you've ever heard of the song by Billie Holiday, um, Strange Fruit. Lynching is a very normal part of Southern living. For uh, African-Americans, um, it is one of the things um, that Black people find themselves having to navigate as a part of their daily lives particularly in the South. When we come out of slavery, right, just to sort of take us back and sort of bring us forward to how lynching, you know, evolves. When we come out of slavery, when we move into the emancipation period, post-Civil War, um, you have African-Americans with the 13th Amendment gaining, uh, or the, the end of slavery happens in terms of the 13th Amendment. Then you have the 14th Amendment that gives African-American citizenship. Then you have the 15th Amendment that gives African-American men the right to vote, right? So one of the driving forces of lynching becomes um, African-American political voice. So it's that period between the 15th Amendment and somewhere around the end of Reconstruction, where you see about 2,000 African-Americans going into political offices, right, or having political office. So for a traditionally white-dominated system, that's a problem, right? Um, you now have people who were formerly enslaved, who were, you know, historically subjugated now, being able to take on positions of political office. That's a concern for a lot of white Southerners. So we see a lot of different things happening to circumvent that, right? So we see grandfather clauses, we see poll taxes, we see literacy tests, all those things being implemented to help sort of challenge, undermine, and obliterate African-American political engagement. One of the other things we see um, emerging in response to African-American political engagement is violence and intimidation, lynching being among those things, right? And so lynching becomes one of the pieces of a much more uh, sort of broad systemic approach to circumventing African-American freedom. Newspaper accounts at the time suggest a lynching of Willie Leapart was not only possible, it was expected. A report in the Orangeburg Times and Democrat, a South Carolina newspaper, said as much in pretty stark language. Since last Monday, when the grand jury brought in a true bill against Willie Lee Park for rape, Lexington has been expecting a sensation in the way of a lynching, and the facts as developed in the trial of the case today warranted such a premature and unlawful termination of the case. But in South Carolina in 1890, the authorities may have wanted to do everything by the book. The news story says that Lexington County Sheriff George Drafts had some 20 men guarding the county jail to prevent Willie from being lynched before trial. But now that the trial is over and the jury have fixed his punishment at death, 
Sheriff Drafts and the 20 men that he has had with him guarding the prisoner for the past three days breathe easier, and the community feel that the would-be lynchers will allow the execution of the prisoner to be performed by the sheriff of the county. The same news story also has some insights into how a 19th century jail worked. Sheriff Drafts, as soon as he heard of the threats and preparation for lynching, surrounded himself with a dozen of the bravest men of the county, and they, with himself, every night since Monday, have been locked up inside the jail, and the keys of the premises were taken over to Solicitor Nelson at the hotel, who retained them in his possession until the morning. That means the prosecuting attorney in the case was the only one to have the keys to the jailhouse, where the sheriff and his deputies were locked in overnight with Willie. In 1890, that's how they ran a jail that sat in the middle of town. And that gives you some context for what will later happen to Willie in that jail. Some stories exactly like what you're describing, where the sheriff or the police department and his deputies or officers really try to go to bat for for the individual who's in in jail. They, They spend the night. They try and discourage the mob. There are also stories exactly on the opposite extreme of officers who are part of the mob uh, or who welcome the mob, who help string up the lynching victim, for example. This is Seth Stoughton, a professor at the University of South Carolina who specializes in researching the development of policing in the United States. And he says the rise of modern policing has some very real ties to the aftermath of the Civil War. Policing in the United States really started in the the 1840s, 1850s, it wasn't until the era that we're talking about into the 1880s, 1890s, that all major cities and a number of the more mid-sized cities in the U.S. actually had organized police forces of some type. Often that was organized under a sheriff, but we also started to really see the rise of municipal police departments here. If you look at old pictures from this era into the 1880s and 1890s, The police uniform is often Civil War surplus uniforms. So if you if you look at these old pictures, you'll see these long coats that sort of hang down to mid thigh and the agencies, the officers who were armed because it wasn't everyone at the time that happened around the around the same time, actually happened around the 1880s. Um, You won't ever actually see a gun on an officer because the guns were in pouches on their hip. And over that pouch was the tail of this uh, this large coat, right? The Civil War era uniform. Just a sort of fun historical fact about like the immediate connection between Civil War and policing, separate and apart from from all of the the sort of chain between city militias and constabulary and uh, slave patrols, and how some of those functions sort of became or got wrapped into modern policing. But the links the authorities were willing to go to to protect Willie before his day in court are not something expected from this period in history. South Carolina's state government at the time was in the hands of a group of Democrats called the Redeemers. These were conservative whites who often came from the pre-Civil War slave-owning planter class that had owned the major plantations and provided the officers of the Confederate Army. Their leader, Wade Hampton, was a Confederate general before he became South Carolina's governor in 1876. Redeemers did not like the changes that happened during post-Civil War Reconstruction, giving formerly enslaved people citizenship and voting rights. But unlike some other later Southern leaders, they were willing to make political compromises with the post-war order, and, especially important in this case, uphold the letter of the law. Michael Burgess describes the Redeemers. White elites, who, while they did not believe in racial equality, they will believe in at least honoring uh, things like the 14th and 15th Amendment. Uh, Wade Hampton III gives a speech in 1877 and says, look, we don't agree with giving African-American males the right to vote, but we're going to at least honor and respect it and try to help and educate them. The judge presiding over Willie's case matches up with that idea. Judge William Wallace, who just happens to share a name with the Mel Gibson character in Braveheart, had been a general in the Confederate Army 
during the Civil War a quarter century earlier, before he became the circuit court judge assigned to the case. This is still when you have circuit court judges that ride the circuit, and so this is when um, the circuit court judge for the area, Judge William H. Wallace, who is a former Confederate general, had been Speaker of the House in 1876. He's a Redeemer Democrat. He had been a red shirt. In the Carolinas, the red shirts were an armed group of white men in the 1870s who often violently opposed the efforts by Northern Republicans and black voters to control the post-Civil War state governments. They have often been compared to another, more notorious group that sprung up at the same time, the Ku Klux Klan. He will be a circuit court judge from 1877 until his death in 1893. It also should be noted that William Wallace's house uh, is one of the houses that uh, Confederate President Jefferson Davis stopped by on his flight from Union forces in April of 1865. So that's the resume of the judge who would preside over a black man's trial for the alleged rape of a white woman. Newspaper accounts of the trial make it appear that Wallace ran a tight courtroom. After Willie's conviction, one press account said Wallace, quote, gave a moral lecture to the assemblage of spectators in the courthouse, end quote, to dissuade them from killing Willie themselves. His honor's talk had a mollifying influence and averted the contemplated act. Wallace is part of that conservative elite. You know, in the history books, we call them bourbon Democrats. Uh, Like a Wade Hampton III, Wallace believes in stability, in order, in organization, and let men like himself and Wade Hampton III, operating in a very paternalistic view, take care of society. So arguably, his word as a former Confederate general, as a Democrat, carries some weight. Wallace would sentence Willie to death for the rape of Rosa Cannon, but he wanted it to be by the book, meaning Willie would be executed by the state of South Carolina. But that's not what happened. Instead, by May, new developments in the case made it appear that Willie might actually be saved from the hangman's noose. When it looked like Willie might get a reprieve from the governor, a mob then broke into the county jail, despite Sheriff Draft's security measures, and killed Willie Leapart in what was just one of several lynchings of black men in the state in the post-Civil War years. Some sources refer to the period between, I would say, uh, 18, the end of Reconstruction, so late 1870s, early 1880s through early 20th century. Some sources refer to that, or some scholars refer to that as a nadir period of African-American history, the African-American experience, because lynching, like 1920s, 1930s, you know, lynching is at an all-time high in that time period. Um, And some argue that the bulk of lynching happens in that 1880s, 1890s to 1920s moment or era. And so, you know, some sources say 4,000 lynchings. Other sources will say 5,000 lynchings recorded. Um, I would argue there are more. Um, just because we know that record keeping then isn't like it is now. There were some lynchings or a large number of lynchings that were public and very much a spectacle. Um, but there were a number that happened that never made the record books. You might think that Willie Leapart got railroaded in this trial. You're not entirely wrong, but an unlikely hero emerges in the story at about this time, even if he's a reluctant one. George Graham was a young lawyer and a former probate judge who will end up playing a very important role in the case, one that would cement his place in local history and for a while force him to move out of the state. Willie probably didn't have the money to hire an attorney himself. Judge Wallace wanted the trial to move forward on schedule, so he appointed Graham as Willie's defense attorney. It was not an assignment that Graham wanted, by all accounts. He knew defending someone facing charges like Willie would not be popular. According to one press account, Graham, quote, begged to be excused from having anything to do with the case on account of the nature of it and the circumstances connected with it, end quote. Graham is, in reading different primary source accounts, as I mentioned, is a skilled orator. 
has is referred to as having this brilliant legal mind. Uh, is certainly an up and comer in terms of not the le- only the legal field but the political field. He will be well respected enough that even after all of this, with Willie Lee Part, he will be elected mayor of Lexington. Uh, and, and indeed, for the rest of his life, he will continue to be held in high esteem even though he went above and beyond what was expected in terms of defending Willie Lee Park. Graham could have easily put in the bare minimum effort for Willie and moved on with his life. But to his credit, he does not do that. He actually mounts a defense. He tells the court he has several witnesses who could give Willie an alibi for the night of the attack on Rosa Cannon. That night, Willie was at a church service at New Bethel AME Church, the main African-American church in Lexington. The church is still there today on South Lake Drive. Walking on foot, it's about 10 minutes downhill from the center of town and about a mile from the Corley's house on Main Street. After Willie's trial, George Graham would lay out the facts of that night in a petition to the governor appealing Willie's sentence. And in this petition to the governor, He points out that in the trial, the prosecution testified that the incident took less than five minutes and then makes the a very excellent time and distance argument, arguing that it is one mile for the Corley's house to the AME church where witnesses for Willie Leapart says that he was all night. In fact, Thomas Waring and Isaac Jones, who are two young African-American friends of Willie Leapart, uh, will mention that. You know, they see Willie at at about 9 o'clock. Now, Thomas Waring will leave for 20 minutes uh, to go supposedly go up the road. I believe they lived in an African-American neighborhood on on what is today Maiden Lane. Maiden Lane, just to the south and slightly downhill from Lexington's downtown, was the town's main black neighborhood at the time, and even into the 1960s, when it would be cleared out for development. Today, the town of Lexington has its large town hall complex, on the former site of this neighborhood. And will return and Willie is still there. So if you take all of that in consideration, you know, nine o'clock is when the crime is supposedly occurred. Uh, according to the prosecution, it, it took less than five minutes. But then Willie had to have gone from the moment Thomas Waring disappeared, gone a mile, walk or run, to the Corley's house, engaged in all the dialogue at the Corley's house, committed the crime, eluded all all the people that are looking for him, and been back in a church in less than 20 minutes. Uh, And I can tell you, having done that walk, there is absolutely no way humanly possible you can even run and make those things happen. To underscore that point, Michael and I actually walked the route ourselves from New Bethel Church to the site where Simeon Corley's house once stood. Okay, so we are walking up South Lake Drive in Lexington, up from New Bethel AME Church uh, toward downtown Lexington. And this would have been the route that Willie Leapart would have had to walk that night, right? Right, Uh, allegedly he would have had to leave here approximately at nine o'clock on the night of January 26th, uh, actually he and his brother, and in 20 minutes, they would have had to walk from here to a mile to where Rosa Cannon and staying with Simeon Corley's family at his house, he and his wife's house, commit the crime, which prosecution in, in the February 21st trial says took five minutes and then make it back before the two eyewitnesses that will not testify at the February trial. They said they saw him all Sunday night, except for 20 minutes where Thomas Waring and Isaac Jones went, I guess, to, to, to their home, which would have been up in an African-American neighborhood just up on our left here, uh, and then came back, and Willie is, Willie is still here. So in 20 minutes, he has to make it up, commit the crime, elude, the, the white men who have been, who have been, you know, coming to help and make it back here when, when Thomas Waring and Isaac Jones come back. And we are walking slightly uphill now, heading toward the middle of Lexington. 
and it's it's already you know it's a it's going to be a bit of an effort going uphill uh, right toward the area where he would have had to to make this trip and, and if he was doing this he's not i doubt he's running at a sprint to get to this specific house to commit this crime and then sprinting back uh so i think it's at the pace we're walking however if you want to conjecture well well he could have done it just understand he would have had to been at a solid jog at this point in 1890 clothes which is not a windsuit not running tights not running shorts in, in, in january of 1890 and have committed this crime and taken five minutes to do it according to the prosecution uh, and then hustled back down here here's where i want to make a kind of cliched comparison and one of the other people i've talked to for this podcast also brought up and that's that george graham comes off in these records as a kind of real-life Atticus Finch. In the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, which you almost certainly had to read in high school, Atticus Finch is the father of the main character. He's an attorney in 1930s rural Alabama who valiantly defends Tom Robinson, a black man accused of raping a white woman. In the pantheon of American literature, he's become a kind of icon for how a white man in Graham's position should have responded to the injustices of the Jim Crow South. And it's impressive how much George Graham does lean into that role in the case of Willie Leapart, even if in both the case of Graham and Atticus Finch, their legal determination to put up the best defense for their client doesn't lead to a just outcome. Despite what all those witnesses told Graham about the night of the alleged attack, when it came time for Willie to stand trial, the defense would put up a grand total of zero witnesses. Even though Graham listed at least a dozen witnesses who would provide Willie a solid alibi, none of the people who say they saw Willie at church that night would come forward to try to save him. And Michael says that's not really all that surprising. If you understand the Jim Crow South, that is not surprising. It is not because they don't want to testify for Willie Lee Park it is because they understand if they testify for Willie Lee Part, who is being uh, accused of raping a white woman, that they themselves and their family risk violence being done unto them. The newspaper account, by the way, simply says in its last line, the defense was an alibi, but it didn't work. Without any support for Willie on the witness stand, the trial was short, wrapping up in a day. It only took 20 minutes for the jury, which was made up entirely of white men, to find Willie guilty. For the heinous crime, Judge Wallace sentenced the teenager to be hanged until he was dead. We know that the star witness for the prosecution was Rosa Cannon herself, as reported in the Times and Democrat. Her wrongs were detailed by her today on the stand in a modest and convincing manner. Rosa recounted again the story about a young black man entering the Corley house while she and her brother were alone babysitting the Corley's daughter, while Simeon and Martha Ann Corley had, like Willie and his defense witnesses, gone to an evening service at church. In the Corley's case, that was the predominantly white St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in downtown Lexington, about a mile from their house on Main Street. Rosa reported that the man had entered the house through an open window and demanded she give him something to eat, or he would, in the words of the Times and Democrat, blow her brains out. The two cannon children then led the intruder down an outdoor passageway by lamplight toward a detached pantry. While passing across this passageway, Miss Cannon was seized by the Negro, who said it was not bread that he wanted, and threw the young lady to the floor. And in spite of her screams and efforts to free herself from his grasp, he accomplished his fiendish purpose. That's a shocking thing for a young woman in 1890 to have to recount in a public setting, in front of her entire community and newspaper reporters who would spread her story as far away as Canada. But there was something unusual about the circumstances in the courtroom that day. See, Rosa came from a large family. She had a mill worker father, her mother, to whom she said she could not describe the attack, and her brothers, including her brother Owen, who was in the Corley house with her that night. But we know from later accounts that her relatives did not attend 
the trial of the alleged attacker of their daughter and sister. We know that because George Graham noticed, and even when things looked hopeless for Willie Leapart, he would not give up the fight after a one-sided trial. When his legal obligation to Willie was at an end, instead of going back to his life and law practice, Willie would push ahead with an appeal that would turn up new evidence in Willie's favor, raise questions about Rose's story, insert the case into a contentious election race, and ultimately lead to the violent death of his client. Next time on The Wrong Walk Home. The whole reason that double-digit witnesses don't testify is this fear of violence being done to them by the white community. A great injustice will be done, and the innocent blood of your petitioner will be shed. There's a jail yard behind this building where there is a hanging tree, and that prisoners would be that were sentenced to death would have been hung behind the building and then buried at either the white or the African-American uh, Poppers Field. I'm Bristow Marchant. The Wrong Walk Home is a product of the state newspaper. It's produced by Lume Alasali, Jennifer Molina, Rizanti Pickett, Kata Stevens, and Joshua Boucher. Special thanks to Don Blunt. For lots more on this story, visit thestate.com slash Leapart. If you have more details on Willie Leapart's life, death, or descendants, email me at bmarchant at thestate.com. Bye.